When God gave man dominion over all the animals in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, he failed to mention the smallest forms of life actually have dominion over us. During early human history, disease and pestilence were commonly attributed to a supernatural source. In fact, the Bible mentions the use of plagues as a form of divine punishment throughout the Old Testament. Until the late 19th century, the cause of disease was neither understood by the general public nor by medical science. During this time, it was standard practice for physicians to perform surgery on one patient and then attend to the next room to deliver a baby without first stopping to wash their hands. As you can imagine, it was very common for the expecting mother to become infected and die within the very hospital charge to deliver her child. It was not until the 1860s when French chemist and microbiologist Louis Pasteur designed and carried out the first experiments that clearly showed the correlation of microorganisms and disease, helping to solidify what we today call germ theory, as well as contributing to a greater understanding of both micro and macro evolution. Throughout the 20th century, many discoveries were made about germs, or rather bacteria, and a great deal of investigation was conducted on the methods by which to kill these organisms and cure disease. The discovery of penicillin by Alexander Fleming in 1929 was heralded as one of the greatest scientific breakthroughs of all time. Research and development of Fleming's discovery yielded several antibiotics that were able to be mass-produced and given to the public. In 1959, methicillin was introduced as a drug to fight Staphylococcus aureus which is implicated in the development of many serious diseases. Penicillins, along with a host of other drugs, are known as beta-lactam antibiotics due to the similar structure these antibiotics share, that is, the beta-lactam ring at the center of the beta-lactam molecule. For a time, methicillin was very efficient at fighting bacterial infections. However, within a few years, it became apparent the drug was starting to lose its effectiveness. This resistance is due to an enzyme known as beta-lactamase, which cleaves the beta-lactam ring. Previously, the majority of Staph aureus strains did not express this enzyme. However, over time and with repeated exposure to beta-lactam antibiotics, the beta-lactamase enzyme became prevalent within all Staph aureus strains. But listen to what anti-evolutionists have to say about genetic mutations and the effect to the bacterium's overall fitness. Antibiotic resistance in terms of natural selection is an excellent example when it's used. I mean, it's one of the... One of the um, hallmark examples given in, in microevolution for support of Darwinian thought. However, I think in the, in the last few years, it's got to be reinterpreted to a degree. Laboratory research shows that when an antibiotic is applied to literally billions of bacteria cells in a petri dish, a few mutated cells that happen to be resistant to that drug remain. Those few cells can then give rise to a colony of resistant bacteria. The question is, how well does this mutant strain survive in the long run? This can be measured in what scientists call fitness cost. How well does this mutant bacteria survive when the drug is removed and it now must compete with the original parent bacteria? These organisms are not able to grow with the fidelity, the robustness that the original parent did, and that's one of the things that we've been looking at. Although this might be true in certain controlled laboratory studies, it is certainly not the case in nature. Since the 1960s, methicillin has been retired as a drug intended for public use because every single strain of Staph aureus is now completely resistant. In fact, Staph aureus is now medically referred to as methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA for short. Therefore, not only has this strain remained healthy and able to replicate outside a controlled setting, it has completely taken over the natural environment where its parent strain once dominated. Here are just a few examples of other bacteria that have also become completely resistant to certain types of antibiotics, yet have not lost their overall fitness. In a sense, this is evolution, but it doesn't go anywhere near far enough to really provide evidence for Darwin's theory. For centuries before Darwin, domestic breeders were well aware that they could produce dramatic changes in existing species. And in the case of antibiotic resistance in bacteria, that's all we're doing. In 150 years, we have seen no new species emerge in bacteria. Well, what Darwin's theory needs is those new species. Dr. Jonathan Wells, a senior fellow at the notorious Discovery Institute, is a perfect example of how creationists willfully manipulate scientific evidence in order to reconfirm their personal opinions. 
but facts always speak for themselves. As new species of bacteria can and do evolve, the most notable example is that of nylon-eating bacteria. In 1975, a team of Japanese scientists discovered a strain of Flavobacterium thriving in ponds where a nearby nylon factory had been dumping its water waste. This particular strain of bacteria was capable of digesting byproducts from the manufacture of Nylon-6, a substance that did not exist anywhere on Earth prior to the invention of nylon in 1935. Further investigation showed the three enzymes being used to digest the nylon byproducts were much different than the enzymes produced by other Flavobacterium, or any bacterial strains for that matter, and these enzymes were not effective on any sources of energy other than the man-made nylon byproducts. We have tangible, directly observable evidence that bacteria can adapt to certain stressors within a natural environment, leading to the acquisition of abilities far different than those of its predecessors, demonstrating mutations can create new and beneficial variations in the genome. These variations within a species are collectively known as microevolution. We also have tangible, directly observable evidence that related animal species can interbreed, such as a zebra stallion and a horse mare, producing a hybrid animal known as a zoris. However, due to the large number of genetic variations that exist between the alleles of zebras and horses, their offspring themselves are infertile. The inability of two closely related animals to produce viable offspring is sound evidence of speciation. And when variations have accumulated to such an extent as to produce different species, it is known as macroevolution. But the observable evidence is that you've got animals that are fully formed. You've got adaptation within a species, but you've never seen any animal produce anything other than... Uh, because that's that not how evolution works. You say Hang that's on, not I have how faith evolution works. Over second. time, it'll turn into something else, but you've never seen it happen. No one's ever seen it happen. And that is called macroevolution. You cannot extrapolate microevolution over time and equal macroevolution. No one's ever seen it demonstrated. It is difficult to understand exactly what kind of evidence anti evolutionists are expecting to see when they claim macro evolution does not occur because we have never observed it happening. Perhaps creationists are waiting for the second emergence of an Archaeopteryx-like creature before they are finally willing to accept the reality of animal speciation. But the vast sequential array of random events required to take place in order to turn your pet iguana into an animal that resembles something like your pet cockatoo will never and can never be directly observed. Even the sequence of events leading to human evolution would be utterly impossible to replicate in a controlled setting. Remember, if it were not for the collision of India with Asia, producing the Himalayas, the rains would have continued to fall in Africa and the savanna grasslands would have never formed. Therefore, our ancestors would have comfortably remained in the trees, having never been forced to walk upright. Humans have evolved in unison with all other life on this planet, and the few hundred thousand years man has existed in his modern form, the earth has been a relatively stable place to live. We must understand that, although life is very robust and responsive to the environment, it is not actively trying to evolve. And, without a forceful push to evolve, life will comfortably remain the same. The historical occurrence of evolution can be equated to a crime for which there is no witness. For a moment, imagine you are a detective investigating a murder, and at the scene you discover the following. The murder weapon, bloody fingerprints, the defendant's DNA, as well as the victim's body. All evidence points to a scientifically verifiable culprit, and it would be a walk in the park for any district attorney to convince a jury of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, even though no one may have actually been witness to the act of murder itself. And the same holds true for evolution. Although we can never travel back in time to physically witness evolution in person, with every passing year the mountains of forensic evidence in support of evolution's past occurrence continues to grow. Creationists do not accept the process of macroevolution and animal speciation because they claim we have never directly witnessed it happening. But that would be like a court overturning our homicide investigation, which includes the defendant's DNA, the victim's skeletal remains, and the murder weapon simply because the judge himself was not there to witness the crime. But better yet, would a judge dismiss the hard work of countless homicide investigators, blood spatter analysts, forensic pathologists, and other scientific experts solely on the basis of the defendant's contradictory testimony? Of course not. Our judicial system, police force, and indeed society at large places such confidence in the accuracy of forensic and DNA evidence that the perjury of a lying defendant cannot sway a jury from objectively examining the facts and ultimately handing down an appropriate verdict of guilty as charged. 
And so we too must be the judge and jury, objectively examining the mountains of cold, hard, forensic evidence pointing a guilty finger at evolution in contrast to the false testimony of creation found in Genesis.